thought we would talk about fine tuning and um, yes. in particular your your paper, um, which I found really like entertaining and <laughs> a mixture of entertaining and like illuminating. It was a really clever objection, I thought. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, and an, a, a couple of other of your papers, I've always found them to be um, full of like sort of really picturesque analogies and nice uh, ways of looking at things. So this didn't let me down. Again, it was similar. Great, thanks. Yeah, you know, it's one of these things. Sometimes in philosophy, in writing examples or in sort of making points, you have a chance to do a little bit of creative writing. Yes. And uh, I, I relish that. Yeah, it's a bit like um, sci-fi or something. that You've got the world yeah. of imagination open to you to, to make the argument how you want. Um, so maybe you can just say a few things about how you came to think about this type of objection. I mean, were, were you thinking primarily in terms of fine tuning or were you thinking, were you already thinking about things like panpsychism and different psychophysical laws? Um, oh, uh, well, yeah. I mean, just the first moment the argument came to me back uh, in, uh, you know, the mid 2000s when I was in grad school, I was uh, drinking at a bar in Austin, Texas with my grad school buddy, Dan Corman, who uh, now works at UC Santa Barbara. And uh, he said, yeah, the fine tuning argument, that's pretty good. Uh, it's just kind of like, I mean, I, I, I think he's an atheist. He's just like, but you know, he thought it was, you know, a, a pretty good one. And, and it is a very impressive argument. And I was kind of like, oh, what do I have against that? It just came to me that like, hey, maybe you could like fiddle with the psychophysical laws and get out of that. And then I was like, I was like, all right, cool. Uh, and, and Dan has some dualist tendencies that made him think like, all right, yeah, you know, uh, we shouldn't be treating psychophysical laws as metaphysically necessary. Uh, so uh, then uh, I kind of liked that idea. I saw like, hey, maybe this is has a paper in it. Uh, I wrote a short thing uh, for analysis, just looking into the relevant literature about this stuff. Uh, uh, it got rejected a few times down the line, but uh, uh, there you know, were some friendly referees at American Philosophical Quarterly who liked this paper and now it exists. Nice. So the paper is called um, Fine Tuning Versus Electrons in Love, yep. which is uh, a cool title anyway. I mean, it's an analysis sounding title. I always associate yeah. that with analysis. But, um, OK, cool. So maybe, should we just dive into the to the argument? So yeah. um, you set up the fine tuning argument in a relatively straightforward way. It's kind of similar to the way Robin Collins puts it. Right? That, um, well, I mean, the way I think about it is that the first, well, this you wrap both of these up into one premise, right? But well, the the fact that the universe is life permitting is more likely on theism than it is on naturalism. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so it's fallen out of my brain for some reason. I just looked at it two minutes ago. Uh, yeah. So the way I have the argument is uh, the first premise is that, you know, for intelligent life to exist, as is the case, the fundamental physical constants have to have values within very narrow life permitting ranges. So yeah. the idea there is if you move the constants around, if you set the uh, 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 strong nuclear force too low, that's the one that I like use in the paper as, as an example, uh, then you can't make atoms bigger than hydrogen because the uh, protons, the atomic nucleus, being all positively charged, just repel each other. And uh, you've, yeah, hydrogen is the best you can do, one proton and one electron, and uh, good luck having minds of our, our, our type physical you know, structure in a world like that. Uh, so that's why uh, if finding tuning is true, this is the second premise, divine probability raising, if that first claim is true, then it's more probable that God set the values of the constants than they took those values without God's intervention. Uh, and that seems plausible to people because, look, you know, those very narrow life permitting ranges, and physics seems to suggest this, you know, if, uh, you know, our current understanding of the physical world is right, change the constants a little bit and things go all wrong for having large mind supporting structures as we understand them. Uh, maybe the stars don't form properly. Uh, maybe uh, everything flies apart so fast that you can't like make anything big. All kinds of uh, trouble for uh, minds physically structured like ours ends up happening. Yeah, okay, good. So is there, I mean, so often with these arguments, the first, the, the fact of fine tuning is mm -hmm. not explicitly stated as a premise. It's really just something that's built into the, it's implicit, sometimes explicit, but in the background knowledge um, part of the, mm -hmm. the um, equation. It's not stated explicitly. So did you choose strategically 
that it was worth putting it as a premise in the argument rather than sort of keeping it in the background knowledge. Well, uh, I want my arguments as I present them in the paper to be valid. So yeah, <laughs> trying to make all the stuff, you know, uh, explicit is is important. Uh, yeah, and one of the things I was also doing was, uh, at least the way I have it, I mean, a lot of people attack this divine probability racing thing, uh, saying that it's more probable that God set the values because, hey, I mean, how else would they fall in those tiny, tiny, narrow ranges? Well, somebody put them there is the, you know, uh, a theist's explanation. And so you get the conclusion that God probably exists. Um, now, one of the things I was doing that's a bit unusual, a lot of people attack the idea that it's more probable that God set the values, you know, if fine tuning is true. Uh, and they have arguments from the nature of probability, uh, you know, multiverse kinds of arguments that say, hey, maybe you don't need God, you just need a whole bunch of, you know, worlds, and then, hey, some of them are gonna come out right. Uh, so people usually attack that one, and it, the way I set up the argument with the two premises as they were, uh, was nice for saying, hey, I'm doing something different, mm -hmm. you know? I'm telling you that for intelligent life to exist, as is the case, you actually don't need the fundamental physical constants to have values within narrow life permitting ranges. Yeah, okay, good. So rather than saying it's not so unlikely on naturalism because there's a multiverse or something like um, some reason why uh, it's it's not God's um, intention isn't a good uh, reason to think the probability goes up in that case, rather than attacking what's normally the first two premises of the argument, you're actually saying, look, fine tuning itself, the fact of fine, the fact of fine tuning uh, mm -hmm. relies on this, um, relies on a kind of implicit idea uh, related the relation between the mind and the brain, right? It's the cycle yeah. that you're normally left out, which uh, you're focusing in on. Mm -hmm. What I found really interesting about this is it's a, it's a, from other literature that I've read. This seems to be quite a unique uh, line of attack. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope I get more people interested in it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, it's an idea that's occurred to a couple people independently, uh, including yourself, uh, as you mentioned that, uh, yeah, on, you know, your blog, it, you uh, came up with that and someone said, hey, look at Neil's paper. And so, uh, yeah, so you found that. Uh, but yeah, there is uh, that uh, there is a guy named Josh Brown who was uh, uh, doing his PhD at Michigan when I met him and he had a similar idea. Uh, it's possible that I, you know, I've heard uh, rumors that uh, uh, after my paper came out, somebody who had read my paper said, "Yeah, I refereed another paper that was, uh, you know, making you know your point, but yours was already out, and the other person, you know, did, uh, you know, had some of the screws not properly tightened as well, so they had to reject that one." So, yeah, uh, I, I think like you know, it's one of these things. I just don't know, you know. Uh, uh, it's so hard to get a paper published these days, given the high rejection rates, that you just don't know what's bubbling up there, you know, on the, uh, you know, in the rest of the philosophical world. Yeah, well, I think if a, if um, an argument is good, um, then it probably it means that it's probably occurred to more people. So I mean, yeah. you know, when people say uh, maybe get disappointed when they find out that the the argument that they've come up with has already been had by someone else, then in a way that's kind of a good sign, right? It means you're on the right track if you're yeah. you have an argument that other people think is good as well. Maybe yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So for uh, people, there was one time, oh, go ahead. No, 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 sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna tell you that uh, one time I thought I had uh, come up with a novel way of uh, refuting a certain kind of solipsism. Uh, and so I wrote a short analysis length paper and then uh, I was chatting with a friend who told me that uh, Daniel Greco had published the full version of the idea in Philosophical Review uh, mm -hmm. just recently. So I looked it up and I was like, oh, darn it. So I just stopped, you know, I just uh, threw away the paper and uh, thought to myself, you know, one of the nice things about solipsism is that that's never going to happen to you if solipsism <laughs> is true. Oh, well. Anyway, continue. Well, now I want to ask you what that argument was like. Is it okay. is that quickly? I mean, it's a, it's a Yeah, sure. It is a pretty simple little thing. So uh, the idea is about uh, what it takes to have a mental state that is a belief. Uh, and I think, okay, so here's an attractive version of solipsism, really the only one that I find really kind of interesting and attractive. There are just my experiences, and that's all, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, because once you start doing things that are other than experiences, you've got multiple ontological kinds there. 
And that seems more complex than a simple view like solipsism, you know, uh, should have. And then solipsism looks less attractive. But if it's just experiences, wow, how do I beat that? You know, uh, it explains all my experiences and it's simple, you know, wow, so how do I beat it? Well, here is the uh, kind of interesting answer. Um, so suppose you can argue that experiences themselves are insufficient for realizing belief. In that case, you know, if there's just experiences, I can't be a solipsist and believe the truth of solipsism. You know, so I end up, you know, unable to gain anything by believing solipsism. If I ever believe solipsism of that kind, it must be false. I see. So it's kind of self-refuting, the thesis. <laughs> yeah. Right. Nice. Well, yeah. um, we could spend a lot longer talking about that, but that's not the reason for this. Maybe we'll do that. In <laughs> episode, but, sure. um, let's, so let's go back to fine tuning. So yeah. maybe you just want to make the case and explain the, the argument in your paper as, as you see mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm arguing against that premise that I call fine tuning, that is, for intelligent life to exist, as is the case, the fundamental physical constants must have values within narrow life permitting ranges. And what I'm going to argue is, you can set the physical constants a lot of different ways, including some ways that give you a universe that you would have thought is inhospitable to life, and I can show you how to get life, intelligent life, uh, in it. Um, and I take it what we're talking about with intelligent life is minds uh, that are you know, interesting and full of whatever kinds of properties there are that uh, instantiate stuff like moral value. Because that's the kind of stuff that, you know, why does God want to create minds? Well, God's good and would want to create a good universe. And if there were just like a bunch of rocks crashing into each other and no minds, uh, that's not the kind of universe God would like to create. God wants happy beings that are uh, uh, friendly to each other and uh, maybe uh, uh, praying and in love and uh, uh, rejoicing in the majesty of creation and all that. So uh, need minds for all that. So I, That's how I think about it is that uh, the standard picture is that um, oh, there's different ways of doing this, but it's there's some kind of moral test for mm -hmm. the agents that God's created. So he's like yeah. running you through a universe where there's choices and you've got to like make the right ones and he's rewarding yeah. them to make the right ones. So that's the type of uh, situation that God's interested in. Um, that's the Absolutely, thought. yeah, yeah. And and that's that's a kind of picture, especially with the moral tests and choices, one that theism has been deeply invested in, at least uh, in the West uh, uh, for uh, its entire history. Uh, yeah, so, uh, or at least Christian theism. Uh, so let's, uh, yeah, the way that um, what I'm trying to do then is uh, find a way to get you minds in worlds that are not fine tuned so that the constants fall in these cool narrow ranges. Uh, and the way to do that is to consider psychophysical laws unlike the ones that hold in the actual world. Uh, so the idea here is. Uh, in the actual world, as far as we can tell, to have a mind, you need a big brain like you and I have uh, that is composed of a whole bunch of uh, 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 little atoms put together in a big way. There's a whole bunch of atoms. Uh, they have to have a lot of structure. That's how people usually, and in the fine tuning debate, had generally thought of what you needed for minds. But you know, uh, if we're talking about alternate settings for the physical constants, we should also consider alternate settings for the psychophysical laws, the laws about what physical structure it takes to have a mind. And here is an alternate setting that one can imagine, you know, and this is uh, the way I uh, uh, describe it in my paper. Uh, I say, you know, you could have laws dictating that the particles have sensory experiences of all the forces other particles exert on them, all the protons and electrons are feeling where the other particles are, and that, you know, this then they, they form things like beliefs based on this, uh, and their motions in response to this end up having the features of intentional action. Uh, you could see them as having the mental states that are, you know, that are constitutive of desire, like, you know, yearning to be together, feeling delight, you know, a proton and electron, you know, wow, you know, here you are, I'm close to you, this is wonderful. You know, they could be feeling like that. And when they form, you know, their hydrogen atom, even if you can't have anything bigger than the hydrogen atom, because you haven't set the uh, psychophysical laws uh, to allow a, a strong enough, strong nuclear force to give you bigger atoms, well, that proton and electron 
Electron together could have fallen in love uh, and they could have the whole set of experiences that make love what it is as that proton and electron, you know, fly together as an atom into eternity, you know. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can build up if you just, you know, get imaginative about it. You know, if you have two electrons, a prime number of centimeters apart, they could have the mental states involved in heartfelt communication about their histories. You know, when they're a whole number of meters apart, they fondly remember each other. Uh, I, I did this kind of naughty thing in the paper that was a little bit broke back mountain, you know, uh, the remaining strong nuclear force between the protons. I always thought of the protons as male and the electrons as female. But, you know, the remaining strong nuclear force, even though it isn't that strong, you know, it kind of attracts them to bit to each other. And, you know, it's like two dudes and all that. Uh, that was fun to present at Biola, I got to say. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so you could have things, when every six particles form a regular hexagon, they share awe at the grandeur of the universe. You know, just, you know, build it up however you like. Whatever uh, morally interesting, important, you know, mental property that you think God cares about, I can build that for you in this world that looked to you like junk once you set up the psychophysical laws properly. Mm -hmm. And there's really no limit there, right? Because the, well, when we can move into this a bit more, but I mean, um, at the moment, the idea is if you just allow any types of psychophysical laws, then these types of um, fun sounding scenarios are somehow on the table, at least like, uh, as a possibility right that's all yeah. in the stage to just set up the idea that like once you can vary this parameter um mm -hmm. then these things are now uh, on the table yep but presumably someone's going to say well look hold on a minute this is uh this seems like science fiction right it seems like just creative writing why, why should we take this uh possibility seriously what's this got to do with the argument so well if we were uh thinking about uh, alternate settings for the physical laws, we are beyond science fiction. We're into fictional science or something like that, you know, which maybe some science fiction has, but we're just going into, you know, places that are nothing like the laws of our world. And the fine tuning argument actually tells you, yeah, think about that. So I'm just taking the rules as the fine tuning uh, theists set them up and saying, well, let's think about this too with alternate settings for the psychophysical laws. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, it's just you know the argument requires you to be imaginative about the nomological, you know, the realm of laws uh, for the physical case. Well, extend that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but you don't just leave it at that. It's not just there's the bare possibility that there are alternative uh, psychophysical laws. Um, I think this is a kind of um, it's almost like a trap or something because. The obvious rejoinder to this is to say, well, look, um, maybe these possibilities are just things that you've thought about, but they're not even possible, right? Like maybe physicalism about minds is true. Maybe you need to have um, a brain that's complex like this for there to be a mind. And, you know, that seems kind of plausible. I, I think that you do need, to, for some reason, I have no idea how consciousness works. I don't ask me to explain this, but I think yeah. that you do need a complicated brain in order to get a mind. So I, I'm inclined to think that those possibilities that you've raised um, are, are not really genuine possibilities um, because I'm inclined to think that something like physicalism is probably true. So um, why doesn't that sort of block the argument here, do you think? Yeah, good question. And that's exactly what I deal with in uh, section uh, three of the paper. Uh, basically, uh, I, I, let me agree with you that, uh, you know, physicalism about the mind and in particular a necessary physicalism where, you know, it's not just uh, turned out minds are physical, but rather that's just what it is to be a mind, to be a certain kind of physical structure. And you can't be a mind without being that kind of physical structure. Uh, and maybe the structure is, you know, multiply realizable in some ways, you know, uh, a robot can do it too, just like we can, but you need something physical that's integrated in a certain kind of way. And uh, that's what a mind is. Uh, so that is, I think, a plausible view. Uh, I don't, I mean, uh, I, I sort of regard all the, uh, uh, you know, is Chalmers style epiphenomenalism uh, or physicalism true to be sort of like a, a debate that's uh, beyond my pay grade and for the future people who will have, you know, better, you know, epistemic resources at their disposal than me. Uh, I, I won't go into this, but my head of department has this really cool phenomenalist view. Maybe we can talk about it at the end if you're curious. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. 
But uh, in any case, yeah, that's a hard question, and I don't want to rule out that physicalist possibility. The neat thing, though, is the fine-tuning theist can't go there, mm -hmm. can't use the uh, uh, metaphysical necessity of mind being physical and having a very specific physical nature to rule uh, these things out. You, I mean, other people can do it, but the fine-tuning theist can't. And the reason for this is the fine-tuning theist is committed to there being a non-physical God with a mind. Uh, just to explain how the nature of the fine-tuning argument itself commits you to this. It's not just, hey, look, theists usually say this, but you could find some uh, unusual form of theism that didn't do this. It's, you can't even run the fine-tuning argument without non-physical mind of God. Uh, the reason is, uh, first of all, why non-physical? Well, this God is supposed to be setting up the physical world, you know, and in some way prior to the physical world, uh, sort of thinking out, oh, what kind of world do I want? Oh, one like that with intelligent life. Uh, there's supposed to be, I mean, maybe not beliefs and desires as we have them, but something like that going on out there that leads to the generation of uh, you know, the physical world as we have it. Now, physical things are not good for doing that. Uh, they come on the scene too late in time. There's issues of metaphysical priority. I mean, if it, so are we supposed to have like multiple levels of physical things? I mean, I guess that's possible, but now the fine-tuning theist has gone beyond the physics. You know, uh, now you have stuff that's just not you know, there in our physics picture of the world, and you'd better not be introducing like a sub level of physical entities that are just kind of like uh, inaccessible to the physicist. That's just, you know, uh, I think not a move that's uh, uh, that they'd want to make. And I think uh, there's probably theological reasons why people wouldn't want to go there either. I mean, some people want to defend the idea that God is like ontologically simple. Um, and then it becomes difficult to maintain that, I think, if you have to say that he's made out of a type of substance, even if it's some kind of metaphysical substance. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I think once you go there, it's very difficult to reconcile those two things. So if you're in any sense committed to God being simple, it's very difficult to say to say that. I, mean, I think there's something else about um, maybe you can put the worry in terms of bootstrapping. Like if God is already made of some kind of substance, then it can't be true that everything that's made of substance was created by God because he'd have to uh, have already existed or something like that. It seems to be, yeah. you can't really get the, the so the yeah. bootstrapping example is I think clearest when you think about if God makes all properties, well, he has to have the property of omnip omnipotence, right? To be able to make all properties is really, you have to be powerful to be able to make all properties, but because omnipotence is a property, he already has to have it. So this is by the idea of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps or something. It's kind of yeah. incoherent. I think there's something going on here with that. I mean, you could probably phrase that worry in terms of bootstrapping as well. Absolutely, yeah. Some kind of there's all kinds of notions of priority that are going to go wrong if you have a physical god and you're trying to have that physical god create a physical universe. Um, that or at least are not going to go the way theists usually like them to go. And you could probably come up with more examples being someone who engages with uh, you know theism as much as you do. Um, so. Yeah, that's that's why you're not going to get a physical god. Uh, and on the other side, you know, you can't deny that God has a mind and then run for the fine-tuning argument just because the whole explanation of why God would steer the physical constants into those narrow ranges is something like God wanted mm -hmm. the physical constants to be in those narrow ranges because it would help with generating. Uh, the other thing he wanted, the thing he really wanted sort of intrinsically, which is uh, intelligent life uh, with the good making uh, mental properties. Yes, okay. so if you just have the thesis that there's a God um, which is all powerful and non-physical, but don't include any um, detail about what the desires that that God has, if the, if the hypothesis is kind of bare with respect to um, the God having beliefs or desires, it doesn't raise the probability that any one uh, universe would be created over any of the others. Um, Precisely. That seems to make it in the same boat as the naturalist hypothesis it's supposed to be contrasted against, which we're supposed to take um, each possible way the universe could be with equal probability or something along those lines, however you do that mathematically when there's an infinite number of them. Um, so yes, if, if you don't have any desires in place, then it's no better than the naturalist hypothesis. And, that seems right to me anyway. Does that seem right to you? That, that's yep, that's right, that's right, yeah.
<laughs> yeah. So the whole point of that was uh, to sort of, you know, uh, uh, make it clear that theist was committed to non-physical mind, mm -hmm. uh, or at least to denying the necessity of our world's particular type of physical structures for mind. Right. Um, it's intrinsic yeah, yeah. to the fine-tuning argument, it seems. That yeah. That you can't take one of these escape routes and say, well, maybe God's physical, maybe God doesn't have a mind. Um, it doesn't really work as an explanation of the phenomena in question unless God has both of those two properties. But then your point is that if he does have both of those two properties, then the escape route, uh, which would, well, the, the thing I was saying before about physicalism seems to be blocked, right? That's how the argument goes. Exactly, yeah. And uh, this was actually something that, uh, I, the way you put it was the way that uh, uh, my friend uh, Tim Pickavance, uh, who teaches at Biola, uh, he's a theist, a very good metaphysician, uh, he put it exactly that same way, just saying, yeah, I think you found a hidden commitment of the argument, uh, namely that, you know, you have a non-physical mind, uh, or at least mind that does not fit our world's psychophysical laws, you know, as just taken over the physical things. Uh, and yeah, I hadn't actually thought about it until he said it like in, in those exact terms, but that's exactly what I'm exploiting in, uh, 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 you know, dealing with the objection from metaphysical necessity of physical mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Keep going, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's all I really had to say about that. Yeah. Okay. So, but then, um, so we've set up. I think maybe you can complete the circle here. So we've got the um, the idea was that look, there's a hidden assumption in the fine tuning argument, which is that psychophysical laws are kind of presupposed to be some way or another. Um, but we can vary that. Um, we can vary that variable, and we could we should have on the table things like uh, the possibility of subatomic particles being able to being embodied with minds, right? If you just have the right psychophysical laws. Um, the escape route to that was supposed to be that you can block this by saying, well, look, hold on, those psychophysical laws are like metaphysically impossible. Um, and then the reply, the rebuttal is to say, well, that's true, right? But um, you can't consistently say that if you're also holding that it's met, that there is a, a non-physical mind at, at the center of things. So do you see it's a kind of ad hominem in some way? It's like that the maker of the fine tuning argument holds an inconsistent set of beliefs. I think that's the right way to put it. Yeah, I guess you can put it that way. I, I guess I, I, I don't especially like using the word ad hominem for that, just because uh, it sounds like I'm, uh, you know, you idiot, you're committed. To it. <laughs> you know, but uh, but yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I guess uh, uh, it, uh, there is a uh, uh, you know hidden commitment of the argument that uh, yeah does uh, prevent you know people using it and. It's, it's just a commitment of the argument itself, you know, of, of that kind of explanation that's being suggested. The explanation is committed to something uh, that prevents that explanation from invoking these further resources. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I think, what the, you know, uh, you know, the way to put it is that, uh, yeah. So uh, an inconsistency, right? Is it maybe it's like this, that the person making an argument has to hold um, that non-physical minds are possible because that's what God is. So if there is a non-physical mind, if it's true that there is a non-physical mind, then it's true that it's possible that there's a non-physical mind. So the possibility claim follows from um, the desired conclusion. On the other hand, they also have to say that um, non-physical minds are impossible, right? Which is uh, because that's the only way that you can block uh, all these um, exotic uh, psychophysical <laughs> laws being from on the table. Right? So there's a, there is quite straightforwardly a contradiction that, that they seem to be committed to in making the argument. Does that seem yes, right? exactly. That's a nice way to do it. Yeah. Is that overstating it, do you think? Or is it... uh, well, so uh, actually, there, there's, let me, let me think about this. There's one thing that, uh, see, there's one way to get potentially out of the inconsistency, but it just gets them in a really weird position. Uh, uh, so here's, uh, the, I have occasionally heard a suggestion that like, so, uh, Okay, there is just like very like certain set ways minds can be, uh, physically like ours, or non physically like God, and nothing in between. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that could be done. The thing is, it's just this weirdly disjointed and disjunctive, you know, picture of, you know, what's necessary for mind. Uh, and I guess you can make 
any argument work if you arbitrarily rule out, you know, certain possibilities? Or, I mean, if you just make arbitrary moves everywhere, like, oh yeah, you know, validity usually works like that, but mm -hmm. there's another kind of validity too. Okay, now you can like make anything go once you just start, you know, uh, fooling around or soundness, my goodness. You know, you could just yeah, do all kinds of junk if you want to like disunify some fundamental things. Uh, but here, I, I think, yeah, this kind of picture of mind, uh, the way I sort of put it, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, this is this sentence in the paper uh, uh, was intended to sort of give you a little bit of flavor of the gay marriage debate. Uh, so uh, what I wrote was uh, from someone who accepts that a non-physical God loves us, rejecting the possibility of love between protons and electrons is nothing more than unjustifiable metaphysical prejudice. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, so I think that, that there is some kind of weird metaphysical prejudice that's coming up there like, you know, minds have to be that way or that way. And there's a bunch of ranges that just, you know, look like, okay, well, if you've said these things, why can't that count too? Uh, that are just closed, you know, off there uh, by the theist in a way that's just very hard to defend. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it reminds me of, um, I don't know if you know uh, much about the Molinism as a um, sort of theological position. But, oh, no, I don't, tell me. Well, it's the view that, um, so it's about God's, uh, knowledge um, and the idea is that God has knowledge of so the kind of alchemist view is that God has knowledge of future contingents right so God knows which free actions you will make tomorrow mm -hmm. so for instance he knows now whether you're going to sin tomorrow freely choose to sin tomorrow okay um, and the Molinist position is a kind of a modal extension of that so God n knows but so for instance imagine if you're never actually tested in any way right so it's true that you're not going to sin tomorrow right but um, you're such a weak and depraved character that yeah, had you been tempted, then you would have done, right? So then there's this question about, well, should he really be allowed into heaven? This guy is like, would have given in or something. But so uh. to, to flesh that out, I think um, one way of thinking about this is that uh, on the Molinist picture, God knows counterfactual future contingents as well. Right? He knows uh, what you would have done had you been tempted. So you would have. He knows that you would have given in to sin had had such a uh, situation presented itself, even though it didn't actually. Um, but there's something weird about that in a way, because, um, well, at least the traditional view is that there's there's nothing that really grounds those counterfactual uh, future contingents, right? Like, I mean, and if you think about it like this, God knows if I have a coin and I flip it, right? Before I flip it, God knows whether it's going to land heads or tails. Let's say God knows that it will land heads. But then let's, I take a coin out, and then before I flip it, I just put it back in my pocket. But then I say, you know, had I flipped the coin, right, it would have landed heads. And the idea is that that's got to be true or false, one way or the other, right? It can't be neither true nor false. Because it's the type of thing that God would know which way it would land. Uh -huh. It might be morally relevant to my decision making in that situation. Uh -huh. yeah. I, might, I might give in on the basis that it landed heads or something. So, um, but it just seems weird, that type of fact, right? Like, why, why would it be true that it landed heads rather than tails? It doesn't seem to be grounded in anything. It's not grounded in any facts about the coin. It's not grounded, the laws of physics don't tell you it's supposed to be possible one way or the other. Right? If determinism is true, then no, no kind yeah. of is true, right? But, um, so there's this weird sort of ungrounded facts that just seem to be there. Um, Interesting. So uh, should I understand this as, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, I'm thinking of going a little bit like Lewis-like on this and saying like, okay, take the closest possible world where you do, uh, mm -hmm. And then what happens there? Uh, is is that an open way to understand the, sure, you know? Yeah. So this is exactly how Lewis looks at it, right? And Lewis says um, that there are worlds which are, which tie for closeness, right? So uh -huh. that there, there would be a world, there'll be two worlds, but which are like maximally identical up until the, the point in history which deviates from the actual one, which is uh -huh. where I, you know, I make a decision to put the coin back in my pocket. But in, there's, maximally similar worlds where I don't make that choice and I flip it. And um, I mean, this, the story has to have indeterminism built into physics for it to make sense properly rigorously. But if there's some, I mean, maybe a coin toss isn't great. Maybe it's the decay of a nucleus or something, which is- Ah, uh, I see, yeah, okay. And right. 
Uh, now, one thing that, okay, so is that supposed to be like, so the Molinists uh, had a sort of libertarian free will kind of view then? Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Explicitly, uh, no one wants to maintain that, that view of freedom. Because gotcha. Of now I see what the problem is because, yeah, I mean, if they were willing to be compatibilist, obviously you could say, well, given the structure that, you know, is encoded into my brain, uh, if it turns out that, like, you know, I encounter the opportunity to sin, well, you see what I'm going to do. Uh, but, yeah, if this is supposed to be libertarian free will, I don't see how that's going to go. Well, I think that there are probably uh, Molinists who just say that's that's the way to revise it in light of this problem. But what seemed to me the analogy... Um, Although it's interesting to talk about Molinism, of course, on its own, but the the analogy is that, like, look, God, um, Molinists talk like this. They say things like, look, God could make the world any way that He wanted to, and a range of possible worlds are open to Him. Um, but the He chooses one which is like uh, the best possible world or something, um, and they'll say, look, because of uh, because of your freedom, like because your the type of person who uh, can choose in either way in different circumstances. Um, you'd think he could just make a world, you know, he could just make you do anything you wanted, right? Mm -hmm. He can just pick amongst all of the possible worlds. But Molinists will say something like, well, there are some worlds that are not feasible for God to create, right? If it's just true that in circumstance C, you pick, uh, you, you give in to the sin, right? It's not possible for God to put you in circumstance C where you don't make that free choice. In some sense, the kind of resolution to the counterfactuals are there before God makes the choice of which world to realize. Right? He looks down and says, well, I know that you're going to give in to the sin if I put you in that situation. So I better not realize that actual world. Right? Oh, yeah. I'll actualize a different world. And so they, they, they sort of start off with these facts about what's feasible and what's not, which is weird. It seems to me it sort of compromises yeah. the sovereignty of God. He should be able to yeah. take wants to right um yeah. but it seems like there's something like that going on here when if the theist wants to say well look god can make worlds where there are embodied minds that have like really complex brains to them or he can um he can exist with no mind whatsoever but he can't there can't be any range in between them and it sounds a bit like the Molinist here. I just want to be like, well, why though? I mean, like, what motivates the restriction on what God can do? It's just, yeah. I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. That is, that's how I feel about it too. Yeah. And, you know, another way to put this point, I guess, is, you know, so I'm thinking about what it is to just be a mental state, you know, to be a desire or to be a belief. And, uh, okay, well, if you're a physicalist and a necessary physicalist, you're thinking, it's, you know, there is certain kinds of causation and motion involved, you know, we're going to see those as they show up in the physical, and that's just what this is, you know, okay, well, uh, I, I, I see how that works, uh, but you're not going to get the sort of physical motion or anything like that if it's, if it's, you know, God. So now you have, okay, so this move sort of gives you two totally separate kinds of things. And once I see what it is to be the non-physical one, uh, I sort of think like, what is it that prevents me from taking that property and just sticking it in an arbitrary small physical thing? You know, why can't I do that? And I just don't know what the reason I can't would be. Yeah, I think if if you, I mean, the question would be, well, why can't something who, which is capable of realizing the whole physical universe do that anyway? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, right now you have like, yeah, that's awesome. You know, you can you can do these amazing things. But, you know, you can't, you know, and you can do like, I mean, could we take some like smaller sub part of that or, you know, some not omnipotence, but just a little bit of potency, you know, uh, not omnibenevolence, but just a little bit of benevolence, you know, could we just take the low, you know, low volume versions of these and just stick them in something? Mm. Well, why can't we if we can stick the big ones in nothing, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, look, so let's see you must have presented this argument in loads of different places right then uh, gone around to different departments and uh, explained the argument to different people and i'm sure you've heard all of the the really obvious ways that this argument can be attacked um maybe you can say a couple of things about i don't know maybe one or two of the objections that you uh think are interesting or maybe one or two of the best ones or something and um, yeah actually one of the one of the best uh, and this is just something that like i i don't really know you know how to assess 
uh, uh, the probabilities of this scenario. But it was one suggested by one of the referees uh, of the journal, uh, American Philosophical Quarterly. But uh, here was the idea. So, um, okay, so uh, how are we going to think about the distribution of psychophysical laws and physical laws over the whole probability space of how laws could be? Um, so are there worlds, and this is just like a, a tough issue for people who think about laws. I mean, they, you know, different views will say different things about this. You know, could you have a world where the physical laws are like in our world, but the psych there, and there are psychophysical laws that allow for mind, but sadly they don't allow it for any of that physical stuff. They only allow it for exotic particles that our physical laws just do not allow. Uh, could you have a mismatch like that? Uh, now, if you could have a mismatch like that, uh, really what the, f you could run a version of the fine tuning argument that's based on what is the probability of a match? Mm -hmm. Because what you need for mind is for the psychophysical laws to say, yeah, you get minds if the physical structures, you know, are instantiated. So you need those two things to match up psychophysical laws that give the minds to the physical structures and the physical structures being there. Mm. Now, mm. So the, yeah. So what you're saying is that the, if the psychophysical laws um, allowed for electrons to be in love, but the yeah. physical laws didn't allow for electrons to exist, then they yeah. didn't, right? and it wouldn't help you in any way. I yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so really, so here's the sort of a new way to run this. Uh, you think about, uh, okay, so uh, what is the probability of laws that overlap properly for minds to be instantiated? Now, one thing here, this is a problem for the probability calculations in the original argument and for a bunch of you know different ways of running the argument. I mean, I have no idea how to assess that probability. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just, it's really tricky, but maybe some kind of argument can be made the probability is low. That's, uh, and then, uh, you know, you need God to, you know, set up a match rather than to set up, you know, uh, physical constants in the narrow range. That's an interesting one. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, a couple other ones. If you have anything to say about that, uh, uh, go ahead. To, uh, I, can, I can go through some others it's if you... an interesting objection. Um, I think that, I mean, look, off the top of my head, uh, I don't, I'm not sure... I mean, part of me thinks that with those types of inscrutable, potentially inscrutable probabilities, maybe one strategy is to just apply a principle of indifference. I mean, you just have to say, with nothing else to go on, I just have to assume it's 50-50, whether the psychophysical laws match anything that actually exists in the universe that they hold. Um, and what's the argument that motivates any other probability distribution? If you don't know anything, then Got it. Sort of indifference yeah. of being 50. On the other hand, the only other solution I can see is that um, if the probabilities are inscrutable, then, then no number can be assigned to them. Right? You can't. You don't have to give numbers to every. Um, it, it's, it's something like our knowledge doesn't cover that case, so there's no way of saying what the probabilities are. Like the way the skeptical theist will say that they can't say yeah. what God would desire or something. You know? um, yeah. I think in either of those cases, it wouldn't be devastating. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, one of the things that makes it a little bit hard for me to go the indifference route on this is that here we're dealing with something that's sort of generated by it's a function of two other probabilities. You know, well, what's the probability of minds being, you know, the psychophysical laws being so and so, and the physical laws being so and so. And so, I mean, may maybe the thing to do when you have two inscrutable ones is just to go indifference on the thing that they're both based on. So that would be like, if that's your suggestion, I, I don't really know uh, how to push back against it. It's kept to say, you know, usually what happens is I try to, you know, figure out what's going on at the bottom with the two other things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's just a weird place to go straight to indifference, I guess, is what I what I, I think I agree. Like, if I didn't know what the, the odds were in the lottery, um, and you said, well, what are the chances that we've both won? It would be weird to say, well, I guess it's 50-50 that we've both <laughs> yeah, won. Yeah. That doesn't seem wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe two inscrutables means inscrutable. Maybe that's more sensible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing I suggested in sort of my, you know, uh, in the footnote where I respond to this is, uh, I mean, here's just one way to at least get some kind of 
push towards uh, you know it being scrutable and the probability being high, which is what uh, mm -hmm. would be the neat thing along the lines of my argument to say back because the sort of you know form of the move I'm making is, hey, the probability of having everything work out isn't as bad as you think. Uh, and so here's how you do it with that. Um, you just think about like, okay, maybe the psychophysical laws, if we consider the distribution of possible laws, you know, maybe our world has really nice psychophysical laws that we don't know about because there's nothing that was instantiated on the physical side to you know realize those kinds of lines. So maybe there is uh, some kind of exotic particle you know that doesn't exist in our world, some totally alien particle that only exists in other possible worlds with different physical laws. And yeah, if that particle exists, it's going to be so happy, you know. Uh, but as it turns out, it didn't exist. So oh well. So maybe for just maybe our world is set up so that for any exotic particle, we had those like super permissive psychophysical laws that make any particle so happy among the ones that don't happen to exist, you know? Uh, so if that's the way it works and you just think about these really sort of, you know, uh, prolifically, you know, permissive psychophysical laws, you know, if those are, you know, an uh, sort of an option here, uh, then you get high probability, or maybe we could push towards your 50-50 neatly by having just seeing how big things get, how permissive things get, how mind-friendly, as I say in the paper, things get on the mind-friendly end. Mm. Uh, yeah, because, okay, so if at the extreme end of the mind-friendly scale, anything counts, yeah, yeah, that means that the probability of a mismatch goes very low because it would be yeah. hard to find the universe that wouldn't allow something to be uh, minded in that, mm -hmm. that way. I see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, it's hard for me to see it properly. I mean, isn't it counterbalanced if you have a really strict low end where yeah. you have a mind? That's right. That's right. So, I mean, if that gets me sort of like a distribution so that, you know, it turns out that a uh, you know, if you just look at the psychophysical laws and you pick a random physical world, you get 50-50. Mm -hmm. You know, if that physical world is intentioning mind, all right, not bad, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, maybe maybe we can, the theist will push back on this and say like, well, but, uh, you know, we have a good world. Why did we, why did we get a good one? Well, okay, maybe half are bad and half are good of the minded ones. Okay, now you get a quarter of them uh, being good minded worlds. And the theist, you know, was promising us like really, really improbable that there's no God, you know, without, or there's no mind without, without God. Uh, and one quarter probably isn't going to do the kind of work the fine tuning theist was looking for. So, yeah. yeah I mean, it seems like there's this question of what, how finely tuned does something have to be for it to be finely tuned? Like, I mean, um, so I talked to some people who, who know physics much, much, much better than me, who say that the phys physicists debate one another with, about you know, some of these constants. It's called quite widely accepted that, you know, um, d there's you know, these measures, they say things like if you, if you were to uh, express this unlikeliness as the distance of the, between here and the sun, then it's like the width of one human hair is like how unlikely it would be. You know, these things go, okay, well, that's incredibly finely tuned. I get that. But then there are other ones where it's like, um, actually, no, you could increase whatever, it, which one was it? Something like you can increase the entropy in the early stages of the universe by a hundred fold and you'd still have um, life. And it just seems to me that if the range is between what we currently have and a hundred times greater than this, is that fine? I mean, it doesn't, I don't know how, what well, what point does you know? It seems like a question of vagueness here. Like, at what point is does something become finely tuned? You know, if I increase one amount of fine tunedness and keep doing that after a while, I think I could call any measure finely tuned. Right? There has to be some cutoff point. Um, and so, if you all you need to do is, it seems to me, uh, raise the probability up to something where it seems like a borderline case of being finely tuned, um, and you've you've uh, done some significant damage. I mean, like, yeah, I don't know, if you can make it even ten percent likely that. And even if 90% of the worlds are mismatch, if you could argue that, it's reasonable to yeah. of them one. Is 10% count as finely tuned? I don't know. Right. <clears throat> so uh, I think the way to uh, <clears throat> understand this issue is that uh, the, so, f I mean, at its, you know, 
the, the grand promise of the fine tuning argument is going to be like, okay, t you know what all your objections to theism, you know, look like, okay, you have some good objections over there. We get the problem of evils out there. We get there's, I mean, that to me is like just the big one. Um, and, and we get your like simplicity worries about adding a God to the picture of the world. Okay. Yeah, that's also a, a pretty big one. Um, okay. We, we see all those, but you know, here's, you know, this horrendously improbable thing, the existence of mind in the world, mm. and we can give you an explanation and just run our inference to the best explanation. And you'll see that this is such a powerful explanation of an amazing improbable thing. Uh, that it's just going to blow all your other objections away, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, if you get them to like, uh, you know, one in four, 10%, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, you know, you're, you're not really doing that anymore. So, yeah. Okay. So, in some senses, because the argument is so, it's like, like ambitious in the sense that it's saying, look, it's so super low on naturally, just so low, right? It's like, there's this number from Penrose where it's like 10 to the 10 to the 123. I'm like, <laughs> I, don't think, I don't even know how to make sense of that number. I don't know what that means. Um, and yeah, so you, you're bowled over by how unlikely it is. Um, and then they say, well, look, on theism, it doesn't have to be very likely. It just has to be better than that for it to be like preferable as an explanation. Um, but it seems like, well, if that's, the, if that's it, I mean, then you don't have to make it very likely that minds exist on some other hypothesis, the, the sort of strategy that you're doing. You don't have to make it very likely because all they're saying is, look, on theism, it has to be larger than this small number, stupidly small number. It makes their job easy, right, from that point of view. But then it makes the response kind of easy as well. Because you say, well, look, I don't know how, how many um, universes are going to be mismatched, but it's probably going to be better than... 10 in 10 to the 120, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know. So it seems to me like uh, the smallness of the numbers makes it easier to turn the argument round or something, right? It's like all you have to do is a sort of mildly plausible suggestion that right? turns yeah. the ship pointing in the other direction. Yeah, that's 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 how I see this. Uh, yeah, um, and, and it's interesting. This is, I think, the way that uh, some of the, you know, theists fond of the argument also, you know, see this. Uh, the... Uh, I remember uh, there's a philosopher, uh, a very good epistemologist at uh, Notre Dame, uh, finishing his PhD now, uh, uh, named uh, Nevin Klimenhaga, who, uh, you know, he sort of like said, okay, Neil, you've got a pretty neat objection to the fine tuning argument. Uh, and I think his uh, take on it was like, yeah, you reduce the probability a lot, but like, you know, given the, the kind of Penrose numbers that mm -hmm. you were talking about, his thought was, Neil, you reduce the probability, you know, or you, you increase the probability of, of us having mind on naturalism a lot, but not quite enough. And at that point, I just didn't really know what to say mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I, yeah, it's just hard to see, you know, I mean, at, at this point, we get into what people's priors are about certain things that I didn't quite know where to go uh, after that. But yeah, yeah that's exactly what I'm trying to do is to, I mean, if I can get it to like, you know, one in four, one in 10, something like that, that power of the argument uh, is dissipated somewhat. Okay, good. So let me ask you um, one more thing. So I had uh, been thinking of this. So one of my, if I'm honestly trying to appraise the argument, like, and I'm not just like playing the game of like, you know, analysis just to see what which things I can think of and how, how the arguments run and stuff, which is fun. I like doing that. Right? But if I'm honestly like sitting there and thinking, you know, does does this argument make me persuaded? Um, and, you know, sh should I think of it as something which is evidence in favor of this potentially life changing uh, idea that I might take on board? You know, how do I like? What's going on there? If I'm honest about it, I really do think that one of the reasons I find it so hard to accept, it seems to me like a, it doesn't really matter about lots of these details. The, the fundamental worry I have is that, and I'm interested to what you think about this, there's something about the idea of, so we've been talking about non-physical minds, but I am I think I'm more worried about the idea of a non-temporal mind. Like, I'm not really sure what it means to be a mind. So for me, I feel like the, what it is to be a mind is more or less just to be a kind of sequence of experiences, whatever they are, desires, beliefs, whatever. Um, and when, you know, if I, if I, the closest I can come to thinking about not being a sequence of events is when I go into a dreamless sleep, right? But then it just seems to me that my mind really doesn't exist at that point. 
my brain still exists, but my mind literally stops existing when I'm in a completely dreamless state. Um, so no ex no sequence of experience just feels like it means no no mind. Um, so just in somehow it sounds like it couldn't be a, a, a mind which wasn't a sequence of events, a sequence of experiences. And yet that's exactly the thing that the theater is trying to tell you. And, you know, even apart from mind, I have, you know, uh, uh, sort of some difficulty conceiving of things existing without time. Mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, what exactly that is. I mean, uh, something is there for a while, or it's always there, or, you know, it's never there, but it just exists independently of time is hard. I mean, independently of space, maybe I can do if I think of just like experience itself, you know, existing, you know, independently of space at all. Okay. But, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what it is for a physical thing, a non-minded thing to sort of exist without time. It's a little bit hard for me to get a sense of that. And uh, I mean, when people talk about like abstract objects existing outside of time, I'm, I'm just not really sure what to think there. Uh, maybe Kant got something about the nature of our you know, experience, right? That we do see things as existing within time. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So, like, I think, um, so the intuitionists in philosophy of maths, like Brouwer, I think they take from Kant some insight about uh, what it's like to be my, a mind, which is something to do with the number line, right? Like it's like this, I think that idea of sequencing, like one, two, three, or whatever, that's, uh, we know what that's like through our direct apprehension of being uh, conscious, which is because of this temporal sequencing. But I think like, yeah, you can abstract away the idea of being a mind in space, and it doesn't really do do much to what it's like to be a mind. If you try and abstract away what it's like to be a mind in time, you're taking away this kind of fundamental, essential attribute that it that it has. And I, I'm just worried that you're left with nothing. You're actually left with nothing at that point. It just it literally means that there's the concept's incoherent or something. I, mean, I can't spell this out quite clearly. I just wondered what you, if you had Got it. Yeah, actually, let, let me let me let me try to suggest some way of figuring out what the timeless mind would. Okay, so maybe there's some kind of distinction we can draw between sort of the objective, you know, sort of passage of time in the physical world, you know, where you know physical causal processes you know go on, and sort of experience as of time's passage, mm -hmm. and maybe you could have. You know, experiences uh, uh, continuing in time, uh, and uh, uh, you know, so for you know, you just have a sequence of experiences. You don't have the physical thing because maybe there's no physical world around you in in the, this scenario we're imagining, but just have the experience of passage. You have all the phenomenology. So if if really what we're trying to get rid of is the sort of physical events time you could maybe leave the mental intact if you see the sort of experience of time's passage or experiences, you know, uh, 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 organized in time and the physical stuff as being sort of separate domains. Uh, that's that's probably the best I can do for this. Uh, and then maybe if you could sort of segregate the problematic aspects onto the, you know, physical side and just leave yourself some nice mental stuff, that that's, yeah, that'd be it. Yeah, I think, and so another way I think about it is like, with Descartes' evil demon, right, this kind of like ultimately skeptical scenario where you doubt everything that you possibly can, uh, then what I th it feels like what you're left with is still um, a demon showing you things that aren't representative of how things really are, one after another. <laughs> like it's still, there's still this idea, like um, it feels to me like time is still, you know, I want to say something like time is still passing in that situation, right? Like, you can have a sequence of illusions, um, but that can't ever add up to the illusion of, of a sequence. There's something like uh, there's something inscrutable about or un undoubtable about that um, uh, experience of a sequence there. Um, and it's something I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something uh, to do with that here, which is why I think you can't you can't re really conceive of what it's like to be a mind and not have. And not be a temporal sequence. There's something about it kind of closely connected there, but I, I can't. I can't really spell that out. Right, right, right.
Anyway, um, I think, unfortunately, although I'm really enjoying this conversation, I think we have to draw it to a close because, um, as you've noticed, I keep getting phone calls. <laughs> and <laughs> it was, um, I need to I need to chat to someone who's trying to get in touch with me. This is a shame. So, um, unfortunately, let's draw it to a close there, and maybe we can talk again about um, a related subject in the future if that if uh, schedules permit. All right, sounds good, Alex. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, nice one. Thanks for making the time. It was really great. Thank you.